Generative adversarial networks was proposed in 2014 by a team uh, led by Young Goodfellow. Uh, they are considered one of the biggest breakthroughs since uh, neural networks um, have been um, uh, proposed. Because uh, most of the for most people think that the technology you're using now, they are uh, uh, great breakthroughs, uh, great revolutions. In fact, they are old. Most of the most of the tools we are old by uh, scientific standards. Most of the tools we are. Uh, doing now, we call AI or artificial intelligence, they are founded in the 80s and early 90s. So this technology, generative adversarial networks, is probably uh, the real biggest breakthrough, the real biggest new thing in the, in the, in the game. And the way they, they, they learn is completely, is somehow different from the traditional way you train an algorithm. When you train any machine learning algorithm, basically you, you provide a set of inputs and outputs and the algorithm will find ways to relate this input with output. Okay, so it tries to learn the parameters that adjust these this two sets of data. In the generative adversarial network, uh, they learn without having these two sets. You just have one set, just the inputs. And they try to find relationships in this, in this uh, 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 data set that uh, is able to understand how the data is generated. So we try to re replicate the, the, the original data set without relying on any output. So uh, I like to cite a, a quotation from uh, Richard Feynman. Richard Feynman say, what I cannot invent, I don't understand. So in the, in the same way, Gans tries to invent data. So that's why we use it a lot in, in, in AZ, because we think they are very powerful techniques that allow us to generate, for instance, for image, they can generate very realistic faces, uh, human faces, just from noise, by mapping from uh, completely random numbers into meaningful uh, uh, mod, um, pieces that you recognize in the face, like nose, eyes, hair, and everything is done completely unsupervised. You don't need to tell explicitly to the system how to build a face. The only thing uh, it learns is a game through a generator and a discriminator, where the generator tries to a full discriminator, and a discriminator, the only task he has is, okay, this is a real image, and this is a fake image, or an image came from the generator, this is a really uh, 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 photograph of a, of a person. Okay, initially the generator will uh, have a hard time generating good enough samples, and the discriminator will have a very easy time to, to separate fake from real, but after the game evolves, this, this competition between the generator and the discriminator, the generator will get better and better, and will come a moment where the, 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 the discriminator will be completely fooled. We will, we will not be able to separate what is real from what is not real. And then at that time we stop the training, and we just use the generator to create our own world, our own reality, that is indistinguishable from the real reality, if there is real reality. <laughs> if you look at the literature, you find that 99% of the work around GANs is for generating uh, uh, images to uh, generate uh, deep fakes or any other image that you uh, probably have uh, found uh, in the internet. At AZI, we use GANs for other purpose, a more uh, um, interesting purpose that is generating data that relies on tables, is not images. And uh, for this purpose, we developed our own technology that is able to handle this type of tabular data, uh, which is uh, different from image because in image, you have very high correlation between pixels. Pixels are organized in the, in the, in the image through a, a very coherent uh, uh, way. And in tabular data, it's not the case. So each number in the row or in the column, there's uh, not the same kind of correlation as you have in the image. For instance, in the face, you always know that uh, there's a nose and there are two eyes and the position of the eyes is somehow related to the position. No, that doesn't change much between different faces. In tabular data, it's not the case. The, the, this type of uh, patterns, we don't find them that easily. So it uh, requires a different uh, approach to the problem. So that's what we uh, came out with our own technology to address this, uh, this problem. And uh, at the moment, you can handle very big uh, data sets and we can recreate indistinguishable uh, sample based on the generative adversary networks that is able to replicate in the sense that the generated data set is 
from the discriminator is uh, indistinguishable from the real one. You cannot separate one from the other. So it means that uh, it's, um, it's uh, good enough to be used for data scientist teams to, to, to do their analysis. At AZ, we are unique in this uh, technology for applying generative adversarial networks for generating data sets. Uh, it's a very challenging problem and uh, our models are being proved to be quite effective, not only in generating realistic data, but data that has other components on it, like the utility, the privacy, and in some cases we are able to generate data that is very good for solving very imbalanced problems, like we have very few uh, uh, examples, and you want to generate more samples, like for instance fraud detection or money laundering, you can have this technology to expand the data set and generate uh, points that are not easy to collect, and you can fill this voids in the data set with our synthetic points that will help uh, machine learning models to uh, get better accuracy. All machine learning models, they, uh, uh, at least the traditional ones, they are relying on supervised learning. In supervised learning, you need to teach what is a, a, a zero and a one in case of the fraud detection, what is a fraud from a non-fraud uh, transaction. In order to learn these patterns, you need to have what's called balanced data. It needs to, the, the, the system has to have as much uh, examples from positives as, as from negatives. If you provide, in most cases, you have like 99% or 98% of the transactions are, uh, are completely uh, normal, just one or sometimes 0.1% are uh, the positives. In this case, if you provide this data to the machine learning algorithm, you, you will probably create an answer that is all the transactions are uh, negatives and will have 99.9% .9 accuracy. But it's completely useless because the data is very unbalanced. So what we do uh, is to make a data set that is more balanced by artificially generating uh, samples from the, the positives that uh, when provided to the machine learning algorithm, you have a more uh, balanced uh, data so that uh, it will perform better when trying to identify uh, uh, the transactions as fraudulent or not fraudulent. But the performance in terms of the AUC or area on the rock curve uh, can be uh, as much as 15%, uh, sometimes higher, depends on the data set. And um, this is a big, uh, in terms of uh, the business, can be a big uh, uh, difference because it represents uh, in a bank that normally transacts like hundreds of, hundreds of millions uh, per day or per month, you get uh, in the end of the day savings, a considerable savings if you can detect, have a better uh, precision and recall from the data set. This technology that we develop at uh, AZ is um, called side style transfer. Style transfer basically is the ability of neural networks to learn from one data set and to project this learning into a different data set and somehow infer uh, semantic features and transfer them to, uh, to other ones. And image is very uh, well known from some applications that you can use, for instance, your own photos and project them into a, a, a picture of Picasso or Mondrian, uh, which has the same uh, semantic features. In case of uh, a business, it can be a situation where a bank, for instance, in UK, wants to launch a new product in France and doesn't, doesn't know how the user will respond to this new product in France. And you can project the knowledge learned from UK to the users in UK and adapt it without having any data from France. You can generate um, uh, this uh, knowledge into France that allows the, the, the customer to really have a, a heads up in terms of the product. It may not be 100% correct, but it's better than nothing. And from that moment, he has already um, some knowledge uh, about the, the market. Of course, if you go to uh, most uh, corporate environments, uh, they still use other techniques to deal with that. But uh, the, the great advantage of neural networks and GANs is that they allow us to um, extract the fixtures. So they work in the abstraction levels so they, it's, you can look at each layer of the neural network and understand what it's doing. It's extracting uh, at each layer, it understands more and more abstract features about the data so that you can hack that features in order to make them uh, transferable, this knowledge transferable to other domains. You cannot do that with uh, gradient boosting machines or logistic regression or decision trees. Is not possible because the data is pretty much uh, working the very uh, contained uh, and uh, uh, obscured way. In neural networks, 
you can hack the system and make them really um, more expressive and transferable to, to, to other domains. It's pretty much like the brain. The brain, the, the way you see, for instance, an animal moving, uh, uh, the way the zebra moves from a horse is not that different. You can, looking at the zebra, you can somehow guess how a horse will move, even if you miss some details. So that's the same, that's the same um, advantage that uh, we are exploiting to really uh, use the data, not just for creating a synthetic uh, twin, but also to expand it, to, to let it express other components that are not uh, easily extractable from traditional means, that just serve one purpose. Here we can serve several purposes with the same data set. What is beauty? Beauty, I think it's... I think the process of creating is a beauty. The moment you are able to create things, that's where you see the beauty, is a, is a process, not the thing. I think uh, when you look at the, at the painting, I think it's not the beauty, the beauty is not in the painting, it's a process of a painting, where you express the abstract representation, what you see. And so if you, have, if you have systems that are able to generate this process, I think it's not guns that are beautiful, is that they are able to produce beautiful things. And so, is it creative? I think they are creative. I think we are getting to a point where we may embracing the most profound and most human activity that is the act of creation. Uh, of course, they cannot create life uh, for now, but uh, they, they are creative, absolutely. And uh, in ways that probably we'll never uh, understand probably can never reproduce in our own brain, but it's just the way they, 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 they express themselves. And maybe they're trying to communicate us something that we don't understand yet. <laughs> <laughs>